We are speaking with Helen Morton Crichton. Uh, now it, it's your family after whom Morton Taylor Road was named. And as a child, you lived in the house that was originally Sheldon Inn. Let's begin with the house and, and how your family came to live there. Okay, the house originally owned by Timothy Sheldon was called Sheldon's Inn. It was the first stage stop on the road from Detroit to Chicago. When the Territorial Road was petitioned for in 1834, the description of it was, it start at Sheldon's Inn and run to St. Joseph, Michigan, where there was a boat service to Chicago. It would provide a direct route to St. Joseph that was 30 miles shorter than the Chicago Road. My grandfather, Charles Morton, moved his family of nine children into the former Sheldon's Inn in 1886. My father, Alfred, their youngest child, was born there in 1888. Alfred Morton moved his family, mother, brother, Charles, and myself, to the home in 1918. By this time, the place was known as the Morton Home. We lived there until 1927. The house was large, as all farmhouses were in the early days, and consisted of a kitchen, pantry, woodshed, dining room, parlor, four bedrooms, and the east room. When we moved there, it was heated with coal stoves and no electricity or running water. The kitchen was large, with a cook stove with a reservoir attached. At one end of the kitchen was a small sink with a pitcher pump. After priming, you could pump water from the cistern located in the woodshed. There was a large table for working area and very few cupboards. When you walked in, the aroma of fresh baked bread lingered in the air. All things, dishes, baking supplies, and so forth, were stored in the pantry. The pantry was actually two small rooms, one with a window and one totally dark for storage. You had to go through the dining room to get to it from the kitchen. The kitchen was where baths were taken on Saturday night. One of the wash tubs was brought in, water was heated on the cook stove. The large back porch had a door to the kitchen, dining room, and one to the east room. The dining room also was large, having a table with several leaves that could be added to seat 12 to 14 people when thrashers came and for family reunions. It also had a large sideboard filled with dishes and silverware. On the west side of the room was a door to the cellarway that opened to a platform and steps to the cellar. The cellar was only under the living room, parlor, and parlor bedroom. The cellar was low and damp, having a dirt floor, and as a child, I dreaded being sent down there to get anything. The living room was where our evenings were spent in the wintertime, around the hard coal stove. The stove was filled from the top, where a tea kettle was kept filled with water, so that we had hot water to thaw the kitchen pump on cold mornings. The cook stove was fired with wood, so it did not hold fire overnight. My father usually went to bed early. Then my mother would read to us or play games, which were usually educational. Dominoes was our favorite. In cold weather, we children undressed behind the stove, getting in our flannel pajamas before dashing upstairs and quickly snuggling into the feather bed to get warm. There were three bedrooms upstairs. The east one was over the living room, and the stovepipe went up through it, so that the bedroom had some heat. My folks slept there, and also my youngest brother, Wesley, after he was born in 1923. I had the middle room, and my other brother, Charles, had the west one. On the north side of the hall was a bathroom that had an old-fashioned bathtub on legs. The tub had no water and only a small drain pipe from the tub that ran down the outside of the house. I never saw the tub used, as all the water had to be carried upstairs. Downstairs, the parlor was at the west end of the house, and it had a large bay window where my mother had her plants. She raised geraniums and sold them on Decoration Day to people going to the cemetery. The parlor also had a hard coal stove, but it was rarely used unless there was company or someone was ill. The parlor bedroom was our sick bay. My youngest brother, Wesley, was born there and Brother Charles had his leg set there after he broke it, sliding down the haymow in the barn. I remember how he screamed when the doctor had to pull the bones in place. In those days, they didn't use anesthetics much, and they didn't have casts, only splints. There was no walking on that leg until it healed. 
Luckily, he was small, so he could be carried about a little. The East Room was living room and bedroom for my father's parents, Charles and Annie Morton. Grandma Morton was crippled with arthritis and not able to keep house anymore, so they moved in with us. Their room had its own front porch and a door that opened onto the back porch. Their bed was in an alcove that had originally been the bar in the old Sheldon Inn days. They ate all their meals with us, and my mother did their washing and cleaning. After Grandpa Morton died in 1940, the farm was divided and the house sold to a contractor. He redid it into apartments that were rented to people who were coming to the Detroit area to work at the bomber plant. A little later on, while taking school census, I was surprised to find there were seven families living in our old family home. One young woman I interviewed was living in what had been my brother's bedroom and half of the old bathroom. When I mentioned that the house was our old family home and we had the whole house, she very, found it very hard to imagine any family having that much room. The house has been bisected, moved, altered, and still stands. And if the citizens ever get around to commemorating the historic s structure, the marker might well read, Sheldon's, the inn that was too tough to die. That is a wonderful history of, of the house. Uh, you were telling me a little while ago about your uncle coming back uh, to visit the house in 1928. Yes, he came back from California. Uh, he had been here before that with his wife, but his wife wouldn't come with him again because she said our thunder and lightning storms were too much for her. But he came back and he extended his visit a couple of days because they were in the process of uh, putting in electricity in the house, and he wanted to see the how old house lit up. So when it was finally in, one night, as soon as it was completed, the, every light in every room was turned on, and we all stood outside and admired to see the lights coming from every room in the house. It's quite exciting to have electricity come. It, it was very exciting to us. Yeah. Uh, now tell me about when the house was moved. Where was it originally located? It was originally located on the original Michigan Avenue, which the old DOR streetcar line ran directly in front of the house. With Geddes Road coming off over the, over the train tracks and going off right exactly in front of our house from our front door, you could look out and to when the uh, streetcar came around there. The stop was at, Shel as at Sheldon Road, where they stopped. But I remember one night in particular that uh, I had an uncle who was a conductor on that line, and the night that Miles Craig's, my uncle Miles Craig's, barns burned, they had the motorman and my head called my uncle up to the front. They were coming from Detroit, and he said, there's a huge fire out there someplace and they watched it all the way out. And as they got out closer, the uncle said, well, we'll stop in front of Alta's and we'll holler and ask whose place it is. And they stopped the streetcar in front and hollered to us in the front door to find out where the fire was mm -hmm. so that you can realize how close the yes. DUR came yes. to our home. Yes. Uh, and then um, the house was moved when uh, Michigan Avenue When was doing the second when they made Michigan Avenue a double road. A double road. And they, they moved it back to the north. Mm -hmm. uh, because they lost the two great big shade trees, and the, they still stand there, but uh -huh. they're no longer any good to the house. Uh -huh. Tell me about this uh, picture that, that we have in the museum of, of the Well, the that's house. a picture of my father's family, which I was very shocked when I went into a restaurant down on Michigan Avenue and saw these pictures in there. The first one I spied was a picture of my grandfather in a streetcar from Detroit. And then as I looked around, I found this picture of the old house. And by looking at the children that I knew who was who, uh -huh. I finally figured out that my father was the babe in arms uh -huh. on that picture. Uh -huh. And the tavern is um, the extension it's the, yes, it's the, it's the room to what we call the East Room. That was the tavern part of the inn. Mm -hmm. Well, this was taken in front of the big bay window where my mother used to have her flowers. And it was my mother, my grandfather, 
and my Aunt Gertrude, myself, and my brother Charles as, well, I'm presuming that he's probably not even two years old in that picture. The other picture was a friend, as Leota Younglove, who was a friend of my Aunt Gertrude's. In fact, the two ladies lived together for a long time until my mother, until my Aunt Gertrude was finally married. Uh, tell me about the geraniums and the uh, uh, lilacs. Well, the geraniums, my mother always took in geraniums in the fall, and she took slips off of them and started them, and then she would have, the whole window would be full. She had like tears that she put them on, and she always figured to have, have them coming into bloom for Decoration Day because the people coming to the cemetery always had to get off at Geddes Road right in front of our house, and then she sold the geraniums, and usually the lilacs were in blossom, and she sold, sold bouquets of them that the people took to the cemetery to put on the uh -huh. graves. Uh, you were telling me also about the area around your house. Uh, tell me about the green. Well, out in front, there was a little a V-shaped place that's, that was between Michigan Avenue, Geddes Road come off, and Sheldon Road. Our mailboxes were down on Sheldon Road. We always had to run down there to get our mail. But this green in the summertime was filled with chicory, and we liked the smell of it too, but we used to get down as children, and we had our old little paths all in among that, and that was our fun time. Lots in the late evening, especially, we liked to be out there roaming around. It was, we thought it was a lot of fun. And where was the grape arbor? The grape was behind the house, and it was quite was a fairly good sized grape arbor. I, as I remember there were about four rows of grapes, and we used to get back there and. Uh, in the late evening, we'd play back there because my dad thought we were still in our own place, you know. We had a little hole in the fence, and then we'd crawl through and we'd play with the, the bizarre children next door, or they'd crawl through and play with us. You told me uh, earlier that uh, one of your mother's good friends was Zara Pong. Tell me a little bit about her. Uh, Zara was, to us children, we thought she was kind of funny. She had a particular, I don't, it must have been a little deformity of her neck, but she always twisted it a little bit. But she was one of the nicest people. My mother had boarded at her home when she taught school at the Cabin Center School here. And uh, of course, they were very, very good friends. And Zara used, she had an old Ford, I would presume you'd call it a coupe. Anyway, on the running board, she had great big, like a trunk, like on the one running board. And she used to bring books from the Detroit Library. And in fact, later on, she eventually had a, a, a library, a small one, at her home where she people could go and get it. But she used to always stop. And I can remember her pulling up with that Ford and stopping, and she'd let my mother go over the books and see what she wanted to read out of them. You were telling me another story also about her uh, in connection with cameras. Yes, she was the first person I ever knew of that had a camera, because we didn't have cameras. I never, I'm sure I didn't have a camera, own a camera until I was grown. Mm -hmm. But she had camera and we used to think a lot. She, she took pictures and she was very generous mm -hmm. with it and she would give pictures. In fact, back in along about 1970, she sent me two pictures that she had had in an album of when I was about six months old. And I had never seen a picture of myself at that age. Mm -hmm. And I was very surprised, and, and her thoughtfulness was really appreciated. Uh -huh. You were telling me earlier also that uh, uh, the lack of cameras is the reason why there are not a lot That's of That's why pictures. there are not a lot of pictures of the, of the house, mm -hmm. because we had no way of taking pictures in those days. When your mother taught, she boarded at uh, Zira's home? Yeah, she boarded. Tell me about teachers boarding. Well, they usually always boarded the, uh, in the families mm -hmm. around the district. Sometimes if they went some places, they would have to change homes. Each family took them for a certain length of time mm -hmm. because they didn't make enough money to, to pay for room and board. Mm -hmm. So the families usually boarded them in those days. Uh, now, 
Now, Morton Taylor Road was originally called Sittlington Lane. It was called Sittlington Lane on on the north side of Michigan Avenue. I don't mean I can't remember what it might have been called farther over because it didn't go all the way through. But it came across in front of the more of the uh, Taylor farm. Tell me a little bit about Gertrude Sittlington. You recall walking to school with her? Yes, she was a little older than I was. I, she had to have been. I don't know just how old she is, but I know that when I started school, I was afraid to walk to school alone. And my mother made arrangements for Gertrude for me to walk with her to go to and from school. Because when we started in kindergarten, we went to school and we went to school all day. In fact, I remember our, our first school teacher. I started school when I was five, and I had Mrs. Shale was our teacher, a very an excellent teacher, a very strict disciplinarian, but she got things done. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started school, and I went to school three years. The first year I had kindergarten and first grade. The second year I had second grade. And the third year, I had third. I did third and fourth grade. So after three years in school, I was in fifth grade. And then my, we used to have to go to write examinations. We had to go to Wayne to write for seventh and eighth grade. You couldn't pass without going for the county exam. And my, the teacher had me write the seventh and eighth grade exam both when I went when I was in the seventh grade, and I passed both. But luckily, my mother didn't let me go on because I ended up, I was two years ahead of everyone, uh -huh. and I was always quite uncomfortable in high school because I wasn't, as my dad didn't allow us to date until I was 16, and I was 16 in April and graduated in June. Uh -huh. uh, what do kids do uh, on dates? Uh, on dates? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I didn't have that many when I was going to high school because I, I uh -huh. envied all the rest uh -huh. of the, you know, the children going to high school. My first real date was the senior prom uh -huh. that I went to. Uh -huh. We used to have a lot of activities in the in the area because we always had a young people's group affiliated with the church. Mm -hmm. Who Clarence Fisher was always he was always there to take us wherever we wanted to go. He seems from the other stories that have been told to have been just a great person mm -hmm. and he was. very important in the community. He was, and he, he did a, an awful lot to rebuilding the church, and uh, it was a real blow to him when they closed the church. But he used to, we used to have the youth group, and every year we used to put on plays, and we always gave our play like at Cherry Hill and around maybe two or three different places. And that's the first time that I ever came in contact with bias against colored people, because we had one colored young man in our family, in the grouping, or not they say our family, but uh, that he was part of our group, and we just thought nothing of it, you know. He was as welcome as could be, but one place that we went to give the play, they almost shut us out because he was part of the play. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, you were a bit of a tomboy in grade school. Always was. <laughs> Sorry to say. But uh, I enjoyed playing baseball. And, uh, girls didn't want me to play with them because I hit the ball too hard. And then I had a terrible time getting the boys to let me to play. But eventually, if I, when I finally proved that I could hit the baseball, uh -huh. they let me play. But only on their terms, of course. Uh -huh. <laughs> Different world back then. Yeah, it was. <laughs> Tell me about your great-grandfather, Charles Durney. Charles Durney, he was a mail carrier out of the original Sheldon Post Office, which was on Sheldon and Michigan Avenue. And that be back in, I don't know how many years he was there, but I know that he was there in like 19... Nine, ten, eleven, something like that. And he said he drove horse and buggy, of course, always. And he said when the roads got so bad in the spring that lots of times he walked. That was the only way he could get through. Uh, are there any stories about the um, uh, the other businesses, the general store or the Sheldon um, uh, dance hall? That 
Well, the Children Dance Hall, that was our favorite place on Saturday night as we only got older. And by the time I was able to go to dances, well then we were living on the Taylor farm. And we used to walk, it was a mile and a half out there. We walked out there on Saturday night. We just couldn't miss the, sh the uh -huh. dance on Saturday night. That was the gathering place of all the young folks. Uh -huh. And then occasionally we went to Cherry Hill to the dance there. You mentioned also the candy counter at Windsor store. Oh, well, that was our big spot of the day when we could go to the store. We had a penny or two to spend because there were very few pennies to spend in those days. And when you did, you, you stood for at least 10 minutes or more and looked all up and down the uh -huh. candy counter to see what you could get the most for your money. Uh -huh. and, and they sold, uh, they had barrels of pickles? And mm -hmm. They had barrels of pickles and they had to, a small meat counter, but of course, most all of it, it had to have been salt and meat or something like that. And I know they used to have the pickles in the barrels. Uh -huh. And uh, the flour, of course, was sold in 25 pound sacks. You didn't think about buying a five pound sack uh -huh. because every farm woman baked her own bread. Okay. And then well, my mother also had the, hey, she had the Detroit News. She had the you call a dealership, I guess, or anyway, the people there in the, in the village took it from her, and they'd come and get it there to the door. And of course, some of them, we used to love to deliver because we'd get cookies if we took it. And Mrs. Gotts was one who always had cookies, and then Mrs. Franklin lived along the next house, and she usually had cookies. And when it come the weekend, they always got their papers real promptly. <laughs> And another thing I remember now too, I remember we, when the streetcar was still there, tracks was still there, and there was between the Franklin house and the, the uh, store was a garage in there. And I remember one time that a car backing out of the garage and he was backing out onto the road and he backed too fast and the car landed across, over the track and couldn't get out. And I can remember one of the men running up the road because it was time for a streetcar to be coming because it, there was a bend in the road right there. And they were running up there to flag down that streetcar. And I remember the men running out there to hurry to lift that car because it was over the, the back wheels were over the track and no way could uh -huh. they get it to come over it. Uh -huh. Frank Windsor? Frank Windsor was, was the super, Sunday school superintendent. He was Sunday school superintendent. And his favorite song was Bringing in the Sheaves, and about every other Sunday we sang it. Uh -huh. And you played the piano? I played piano for Sunday school. So the Taylor Farm was south? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. now, when did you move from the uh, house that had been the Sheldon Inn to there? To the Taylor Farm. We moved there in 1927. Mm -hmm. And then we there, I was married in that house. Was, was that the point at which your family sold um, the Sheldon Inn? Or? No, my grandfather still owned the place. Oh, uh -huh. And uh, my aunt and uncle had lived on the Taylor farm, and when we moved, we just exchanged farms. Oh, okay. And then, and then finally, my dad finally quit farming, and he went to work for S&B Machine Shop. Mm -hmm. Now, when you lived in the Sheldon Inn, were, uh, was that why your grandfather was there? Or, yes. Uh -huh. And, and oh, yeah. were there other relatives living in there oh, too? Oh, yes. Eventually, uh, on each corner on Sheldon Road, my grandfather gave the oldest son uh, a lot, lot to build on. And then and Aunt Eliza Craig, which was his daughter, uh, he gave her another corner on Sheldon Road when they retired from the farm and then they moved there. Mm -hmm. And then in later years, after Uncle Miley died, Aunt Liza wouldn't stay alone and, and my grandfather, by that time his wife was dead and mm -hmm. he used to go and stay with her nights always at her place. Mm -hmm. He did, always did a lot of canning. In fact, in, uh, to this day I don't care much for pork because that was our mainstay in the winter because We'd butcher, and then the pork was canned, mm -hmm. and it all tasted the same. I don't care what you did with it; it all tasted the same after it had been because only one thing we had to can was it was cold water baths. You know, they 
or put it on the stove and boiled it. And then uh, how did you store it? You it was stored in the basement. It was canned and then stored in the basement. Mm -hmm. And uh, all fruits and vegetables, uh, like some of the later things like carrots and things like that could be kept in sand in the basement because the basements, of course, were real, real cold. There was no heat of any kind down there at all. And potatoes were stored in the basement. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I had never heard of carrots being stored in sand. Is yeah, they used to be. Uh -huh. Is that the only vegetable that you would store that way? or? I can remember my mother having beets in there. They wouldn't stay as long as the carrots would. But uh, she always tried to keep all those things as long as she possibly could because when it came cold weather, we just didn't have any greens of any kind. Uh, and I can remember that we used to take, pick the tomatoes, the green ones, and wrap them in paper individually and put them uh, in the basement. And lots of times you could keep them you'd have tomatoes ripening up as far as Christmas. That's always interesting. made lots of jams and jellies. From the time, I don't know how old I was when I learned how to milk. I know I was milking cows by the time I was nine years old. But then we had to get up and get dressed and go to do chores in the morning. And then you, had, you came in for breakfast and had to change your clothes to go to school. And probably chores after school. Oh, yes, also. after school. We better be home to do chores. What, what responsibilities did you have? I, ha I got stuck with a lot of them. I had a brother two years younger than me, but he was kind of my dad's favorite. And he kind of got out of things. He'd fib a little bit sometimes with what he was doing. And I remember when we were on the Morton farm, we had way at the east end of the barn, there were two, it was sort of on just a little bit of a knoll. And there were two box stalls down there that were lower than all the rest. And they had a chute out of the bow that you could put hay down to the horses. And uh, my father's relatives in Detroit, which were the hunters who had sponsored my grandfather coming over here, they owned a cartage company down there. Well, then they, of course, it was all with horses. And when they had a horse that was going to foal, they used to bring him out there to the farm. And that was where my father kept them in these two box stalls down there. And they had to feed them from the hay up town. Well, my brother was supposed to feed them. And my dad caught on that he wasn't, he found there was no hay down there. So he comes in and he says, well, he said, you'll have to do it. I know you will do it because he says, you won't let them go hungry. And of course, it caused many a fight between my brother and I when we were young. I used to give him a bloody nose every once in a while. <laughs> you were a town. I figured I'd get a I'd get a licking anyway, so I'm. Not. Uh, so you fed the horses and you milked the cows. What what other choice did you? Well, have? you had to feed uh, the cows. There was insulage to be gotten out of the silo, which was always a job. You have to. Crawl what was up. that? Okay. It was the ground corn that uh -huh. was put in the in the mm -hmm. silo in the fall. And then it was called insulage because it was ground and it fermented, of course, over the winter. And when it was real cold weather, lots of times it would be frozen around the edge. You'd have to try to pick some of that off. Sometimes it didn't come off until it would have a, a thawing spell, you know. But you had to pitch that down and then that had to be carried to the cows to be fed. You had some stories oh, about Halloween. Yeah, Halloween. That used to be a, the high point of, of course we weren't allowed my dad didn't allow us to go out for halloween but uh, a lot of the kids did and they'd take the corn stalks to go in the field because the corn in those days was in shocks and they'd drag some of them out put them on the road and i can remember one of the mckinstries one time made a dummy and put it on the road and there was a man almost had a heart attack because he thought he'd run over a real person and that kind of put a damper on them doing things like that. You mentioned you, your father told a story about his childhood in the Grange Hall. In the Grange Hall? Yeah. That was, uh, he said that the group of them got together and took a buggy all apart, one of the farmer's buggies, one of the farmer, obviously they didn't like too well, you know. <laughs> and they took it all apart and they put it up on top of the Grange Hall and then put it all back together again so that when they got up in the morning, here's this farmer's buggy sitting on top of the Grange Hall. Uh -huh. 
And it was about two stories high? It was two stories high because mm -hmm. they had a dance, uh -huh. would dance in the upper part of it. Must have been interesting how he got it down. <laughs> <laughs> that part, nobody ever told us that. <laughs> what do you remember as being best about growing up in the community that Canton was back then? I think the best thing was that we knew everyone and everyone knew us. and. Uh, you didn't have to be afraid. You didn't have to lock your door at night. And when you went out of your door, you knew whoever you met. And we used to, I think one of the most interesting things when I was real young was that uh, the blacksmith's family, they were Catholic. And uh, in those days, the Catholics were not allowed to step inside of a Protestant church. And I can remember that always on Christmas Eve, we left our church doors open and the children could stand on the steps. And then every, when they passed out the candy, they always went out and passed them a sack of candy too. But I can remember seeing them standing out there watch, they'd watch the program as much as they could see of it from outside.